Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jim Lewis. I'm the executive director of the Pell Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to campus tonight and to this event with Melissa Hathaway. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Melissa Hathaway is president of Hathaway Global Strategies, LLC, the senior advisor at Harvard Kennedy's Belfer Center. She has served in two presidential administrations, both for President Barack Obama and for President George W. Bush, uh, where she spearheaded efforts on cybersecurity policy. Uh, she was previously a principal with Booz Allen and Hamilton, where she led two primary business units, information operations, and long-range strategy. She's going to get up early tomorrow morning and fly to Australia. We're thrilled that she can be with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome from Melissa Hathaway. Thank you, Thank you so much. Good evening. How are you tonight? Excellent. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here and at the Pell Center and at Salve Regina and uh, in Newport in general. I get to come up quarterly, I think, and uh, hope to be here. Francesca, my phone's going to keep on going off because I didn't turn it off, so I need to, I need to uh, do that. Oh, maybe it's up here. That's the, that, that, that did ding. That sounds like a Navy song. It's, it's mine. So, all right, it's off. So I have a small survey I'd like to take before I get started. Um, given that I have a cell phone here, how many people have a cell phone with them? How many people have more than one cell phone or IP device on them? I have, I have at least three with me tonight. Okay, we only have, that's a small number, okay. How many people have high speed internet access to their home business? Okay. Um, how many people have uh, conduct e-banking? Almost well, 100%, I don't. Okay, um, how many people <coughs> uh, have uh, bought something online recently? 100%. And how many people, if you know, have um, electricity delivered to you over the internet since there's smart grids here now in uh, the Newport and Providence area? Anybody? So these are all things, this is cyberspace. And as you have and want that high-speed internet access and your cell phone to be able to ring 24 days, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and be able to do e-banking and e-commerce and everything, that, that's all really important. It's part of everyday life. And, um, and so securing that or making sure that it's available is what cybersecurity is about. And I want to talk to you about why cybersecurity is important to you as a person, is important to um, our businesses, and, uh, and important to us as a country. And I'm hoping that I'm going to give you some things to think about over the course of the next 20 to 30 minutes. And maybe, maybe it might take longer than that. I actually don't ever time myself. So. I want to take you a little bit through history, and I'm going to intersperse some quotes along the way. And it's like, we can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. And I want to talk to you about when we created this and why we created it. And this little timeline, I'm going to start. The internet had a birthday last week. It turned 44 on October 29th. October 29th, 1969 was the very first internet transmission. And it um, was a, a communication between UCLA <coughs> and Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park, California. And that was the birth of the internet, around 11.58 p.m. Um, October 29th. And as you may know, that that um, was a, a program that was initiated through the then um, uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It was before Defense. It was called Advanced Research Projects Agency, a U.S. government-funded facility for research and development. And it started um, as an uh, incubating of that uh, capability was, in case if we had a nuclear disaster, we want our president and the military and the national apparatus to still be able to communicate. And that's why we created the Internet. It was meant to be resilient for a time of war and to enable communications. It was never designed to be your e-banking, to deliver your electricity, to be this backbone of the global economy in every single part of your life. It was never designed for that. But nonetheless, we've used it, and that's what it has become. I'm going to fast forward. It became that way 
actually somewhere around the, uh, 1990. In 1990, while the United States created the internet, those people who have innovated on top of it came from many other countries. And in Switzerland, <coughs> they actually were the ones who created the World Wide Web and many of the search engines that we use today to click and connect and actually search for the next product that you're going to buy online and then use your credit card to do the aid banking and the bank transaction to pay for that transaction online. And that information society was really born in 1990 and has evolved over the last 20 years. <coughs> And with that then, we have been actually challenging all of our governments to enable and ensure that you have high speed internet connectivity at a low price point and almost as a guaranteed right so that you can continue to be that information society, that you can benefit from that information that comes from all over the world. Um, and, uh, and that has become actually a legal right in many countries in Europe to have high speed internet access. Um, and in around 2005, this has become an international kind of a measurement of, of things that all countries around the world are being measured. At what price point are you receiving that high-speed internet access? Is it reaching every last mile of every country? If not, why not? And what is your country doing to invest in that? And so over the course of now of the next few years and the future of things to come, uh, right now we all have somewhere around two or three internet access devices. In 2015, we're going to have somewhere between five and five or so. And in 2020, we'll all have at minimum of 10 IP devices associated with us, with each one of ourselves as an individual. And then it'll be even more than that for our homes, our cars, our businesses, etc. And so I want to talk about what are we doing to secure that? We're starting to run out of time because the time is clicking. 2015, we're going to have six IP addresses. 2020, we're going to have 10 or 20. And with each one of those things, are the attack surfaces growing, our resiliency is diminishing, and we're gonna to have to address it. And so I'm not ha happy with the status quo anymore. We really have to change the status quo. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a countdown. There's an elephant in the room. And there really is an elephant in the room, and people are describing it differently, and people don't want to talk about the elephant in the room, but it exists, and it's here. And it's because we are all really totally dependent upon this infrastructure, right? <coughs> we were on the Eastern Seaboard. Sandy came through. I, um, I have family in New Jersey. And, uh, and as we just said, the internet is part of like every ounce of our being. Well, my folks were without, uh, without uh, electricity for more than a month. My older brother has a small business. He was without internet telecommunication services for more than a month. If I went to Boston and I taught in Boston, it was, uh, they had power but no telecom, so you could pump the gas, but you couldn't pay for it. So there was a big run on how do you get for money out of the bank. Well, again, you have power, but then, you know, if you have no telecom, it was a real challenge. So the elephant in the room is, is that we have put every single part of our life is now running off the internet. E-government, e-banking, e-commerce, your telecommunications, soon to be your electricity, soon to be the next generation air traffic control system is all on the internet. And it's going to be vulnerable. And so we have more than 100 countries that are capable of affecting those services. So when we're talking about cybersecurity, we're saying, oh, we're talking about lots of different activities, and I want to cl be clear about which elephant in the room we're talking about, and I think that's important. Because our leaders are not being very clear about what what elephant in the room they're not talking about. And we have non-state actors that are playing an increasing role in our domestic and international politics. So there's six areas, countdown of six, six areas about cybersecurity that I think we need to be clear about what we're talking about. First is we have political activism. In the United States, we've recently seen a Bradley Manning bring a DVD into classified spaces of the State Department and copy cables of all the diplomatic cables that have happened in the, for, between and among our government officials and expose it on the internet through anonymous and through WikiLeaks. Bradley Manning just went to jail for 35 years. 
We also have Edward Snowden. We're talking about and reading about Edward Snowden every day, right? Edward Snowden did basically the same thing. And the thumb drive, it wasn't a DVD, it was a thumb drive. He brought in a thumb drive, in and out, in and out, copying an awful lot of very sensitive information to the United States government and exposing it um, into the international realm of things. Here they were both political activists. I believe that there are many other adjectives and adverbs you could <laughs> use about him. But they're political activists. They wanted to bring transparency to policies that they didn't agree with. And they wanted to expose it. And they thought that they were doing the right thing. There are other political activists that are happening around the world that they're using Twitter and Facebook to mobilize in the public square to protest against their governments, to overthrow their governments. They're using the internet to politically protest and, 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 change, and cause change in their country. That's a political activist. Sometimes a political activist could be one man's political activist. Another nation might call it a terrorist. And they're using the internet. Second, we also, political activism is not the same as organized crime. How many people in the room have had their credit card replaced recently, or have been the recipient from a letter from Pick Your Place, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or anything. Your identity has been lost, and, uh, and we need to do an identity check. My credit card gets replaced on at least once a year, and I've gotten three of those letters in the last 12 months. Okay, identity theft, and your credit card. Your credit card has value on the underground market. Your visa is worth at least a dollar, your MasterCard might be worth two, and your American Express is definitely worth five. Your identity, your birth date, or your social security number also has a value, because then people can impersonate you, and they can open up lines of credit and other things. And the criminals or the organized crime are actually really attacking our banks. They are heisting, there's a, a real heist against our ATM machines where they're taking advantage of that you lost your pin or you lost your card or the vulnerabilities of the ATM machines. And money is being stolen from those machines, $30 million in 30 cities in 30 minutes. And it's happening all the time all around the world. The underground economy is alive and well and is growing. The third area, which is not anywhere close to the second area, is all of our corporations are being penetrated. There's a grand scheme of stealing and illegally copying intellectual property among all of our corporations. And it's not just US corporations. This is a global epidemic problem. And those, the intellectual property that's being stolen could be anywhere from your next bid and proposal for the next job, that means your job, is on the line, and it's being stolen by somebody who wants to displace you in the market. Your intellectual property is being stolen. It could be the next generation pharmaceutical. It could be the next generation weapon system. And, and it's, being, it's being, most of our companies are being attacked. When our leaders talk about that we've had the greatest transfer of wealth in our time, or that we're experiencing a cyber pearl harbor, <coughs> They're talking about the intellectual property theft that's happening. And that's one of the things that all of our American businesses need to, be, need to be conscious of. Because I would argue that everybody's been penetrated. It's just not everybody knows that they've been penetrated. And not everybody knows what they're losing. But the intellectual property theft and industrial espionage should not be confused with real espionage. Because our intelligence community does have the responsibility to inform our government leaders of the intentions and capabilities of other governments. To be warning, basically, from a real true war. And no government is going to abandon espionage. So when we actually talk about intellectual property theft and espionage in the same breath as if they're the same thing, and we're going to poke and or uh, challenge another nation in that and, uh, and whether or not they're doing that and conducting that and telling them that they must stop, then we're, not, we're doing ourselves a disservice because we are never going to give up espionage, but we don't, as a matter of policy, conduct intellectual property theft. So the fifth area is starting to become more challenging in my mind. And the fifth area is uh, we're seeing true disruption of services. This is where the, our computers that are infected at home or infected in our business are being harnessed to, uh, to bring about a distributed denial of service. What does that mean? 
well, it's a flood of information or a flood of data coming in that's going to degrade your capability to do online banking, or it's going to degrade your capability. It brings down the overall, diminishes the capacity of the company to deliver or to provision whatever it is it's meant to provision. And in the United States, this is our financial institutions. Every bank in New York and elsewhere are being degraded on a daily basis through distributed denial of service. And it's happening more and more around the world. And so why does that matter to you? Well, it matters because you may not be able to do e-banking tomorrow because they can't actually provision the service. It could matter to you because if it comes to a significant enough rate, the actual bank itself will come offline and won't be able to clear transactions. And that will matter even more when it happens to your power company and they can't actually deliver service to you, or your water company and they can't actually deliver water to you, et cetera, et cetera. And distributed and dis degrade disruption of service is going to happen more and more as we put more and more things on the internet. The last part of which I start, I'm starting to become more concerned about is you're starting to see a degradation of infrastructure and true damage of property. And one could say that this first started with the, the weapon that was used to bring down and degrade the overall capability of Iran to create nuclear weapons, and that was called Stuxnet. New York Times and other articles have been pretty well articulate that. But the problem is, is that weapon proliferated, and it's now in its sixth or seventh iteration. And we're starting to see those weapons, military-grade weapons, used against major corporations. And one of those corporations was Saudi Aramco. Saudi Aramco is one of the world's largest oil producers. And they suffered an attack last year called the Shamoon virus. Just think of it as son of Stuxnet. And it destroyed 30,000 of their computers or 75% of their information technology assets. That is a material event for any company. And it was really meant to actually take offline their production, oil production. And thank God it only came through the back office, and thank God it only hit uh, the IT infrastructure. Because can you imagine if you're a business or you're a citizen, if they were able to bring down the oil production of 80% of the oil offline? Can you imagine what the gas prices might be in the United States if that were to have occurred? Right now it's at 375, I think, a gallon in Washington. I could imagine if you brought the world's largest oil producer offline for even a few weeks, that prices would go well above $10 a gallon, maybe higher. So we need to be concerned about the destruction and damage of property because there are military grade weapons that are out there that are in the hands of political activists that are in the hands of organized crime and other nation states that may actually not hold or show the restraint that may be necessary in this, in this world. So this next statistic is going to actually probably alarm you because it alarms me. And um, there are many different data sources that you could use to get this data. And, um, and I used one. It's a company called Trend Micro. Um, and what this shows you is that the United States is the most infected, poisoned, polluted, pick your word, infrastructure anywhere around the world. Why should we care? Well, because our infrastructure and the computers that have been infected in your home and in my business are the ones that are bringing down the Bank of America, are the ones that are being harnessed to actually di bring and disrupt services around the world and or to steal real money out of banks. And that's a problem. And we should be embarrassed by that, and we should want to do something about that. So there are six activities that are happening in cyberspace. And then we're talking past each other as countries of how we're going to deal about it. And the United States leads the malicious top 10 around the world. Current trends indicate that this is only going to get worse because we're headed into the internet of everything. It'll be the internet of things in 2015 where I have five devices as opposed to two or three. And in 2020, I'll have 10 devices because that's just where the technology is headed. It'll be my car, it'll be my cell phone, it'll be my computer, it will be my iPad, it will be this and it will be this and it will be this. 
and all of those things associated with it will be in one more device that could get infected to bring down my infrastructure. And that's why we need to start doing something about it. So now I'm going to do five tensions that exist in the system. Five. And it affects all of us, and all of us as countries have to join hands, to do, and companies have to join hands to do something about it. The first is we're in a stagnant economy. It hasn't recovered. We're growing at a 0.7%, 1% GDP right now. Most of the rest of the world is not growing. It's a challenge. And so what are we doing as leaders and as companies? We're turning to the IT dividend. IT will lower the manpower costs. It will bring us productivity and efficiency at unprecedented levels, 40% productivity, 10% efficiency. And as a country, it could potentially give us 4% GDP growth and certainly contribute, in theory, to the bottom line of our companies. In the same breath, though, we're saying, as we stimulate that economy, well, we really actually are having a risk. We're having disruption of service. We're having unprecedented crime against our infrastructures, intellectual property theft against our companies. And so we have to, we have to improve the national security. It's sort of two sides of the coin, but one argument is winning and the other argument isn't being heard. From the all things that flows, we're doing infrastructure modernization, right? We're actually bringing our uh, industry and manufacturing, we're putting it to the internet, and we're making it internet controlled devices. We are uh, modernizing our transportation, we're modernizing air traffic control, we're modernizing every, our power plants, we're modernizing um, our banking infrastructure, and everything is being connected to the internet. And then on the other side, we're talking about, well, oh my gosh, we need critical infrastructure protection, right? because I need to have that essential service delivered. I can't afford to have no power or no water or no telecommunications. And so then our governments are starting to talk about regulation because you as a commercial business have to be able to provision that because I expect it, it's an essential service as a citizen of which the government is responsible for delivering, but really it's the government's responsible for enabling it and the business has got to deliver it. From there then we start to say, well my gosh, who's in charge? It's the classic tension. It's the private sector, or is it the public sector? The private sector is designing, is building, is fielding, will be the provisioning of that capability. If something happens, will it be the responsibility to restore it? But the public sector is the one who's supposed to ensure that it's a public good, that it's available all the time, the essential service. And so with that, then, we're talking about what are the market levers to actually help the private sector do the right thing that the government or the public sector is responsible for ensuring. And again, who's in charge? There's a great tension in the system right now, and it's really that kind of the marriage needs to come together and to be able to do it. And from there, then, we're having another conversation about data protection versus information sharing, right? I am going to fine you if you lose my birthday and my social security number, right? It's data protection. I am holding you as a government or as a private sector entity responsible for protecting my data. And in the same breath, though, I want to ensure that you're going to share with me when you're penetrated, what did you lose? What malware penetrated you? How long has it been? How long have you been infected? And it's sort of the, we're again, we're talking out of both sides of our mouth, and it's sort of, what is it that we want? Do we want data protection and information sharing? And then at the end of the day, the fifth tension that's happening in many places around the world is we believe that the internet is for freedom and democracy. We believe in freedom of speech. We allow political activists. We're one of the few countries that really tolerate this. And the rest of the world is looking at this as that freedom of speech and that political activist that wants to overthrow my government is a threat because I want political stability. And so when we start to think about what's going on in these tensions between the economics is outweighing the national security and we're infrastructure modernization because we really want to see that economic growth and we want to move ourselves into the digital age. But then at the same breath, we want to talk about critical infrastructure protection. At, at the heart of this is the private sector 
The private sector is at the core of the control plane of what needs to be done and who's going to really drive that change. So that's five. Four. We're talking about the problem a lot. And we're trying to avoid some of the solutions because it's going to be a trade-off. It's a real conundrum of what to do next. And can you find the economic balance with the national security balance? Can you get to data protection and information sharing? Can you actually share the responsibility of enabling the private sector to do the right thing, but allow and harness the private sector to get the things done? And so that tension and solutions is going to require real leadership, of which I haven't seen yet. We have to be authentic. What is going on? The elephant in the room. There is an elephant in the room. Our companies are losing intellectual property at unprecedented rates. The executive branch has to tell the Congress what's really going on. Congress has to listen to its constituency, not just the lobbyists. We have to be authentic and tell a story, a sticky story that matters, that matters to my son and my mom and to every person in this audience. You have to tell it like it is. We can't sugarcoat it anymore. We got to tell the strengths and the weaknesses and the opportunities and the threats. And then you have to advocate. You have to be an advocate of what needs to be done. And it's going to require tough choices. It's going to require looking at, yes, the private sector is responsible. And it's going to require a mix of market levers, not just regulation, but an incentive-based levers. Has to be both, not just one. We need to look at what needs to be done and advocate for it, because it may be that you are going to, God forbid, get rid of one of the aircraft carriers to actually solve some of the other problems. It could be that you would want to advocate for an industrial policy to help our industries remain relevant and as we go into the information age. You're going to have to explain what needs to be done. And then after that, then you're going to have to be an ally. It's not the private sector or the public sector. It's the private sector and the public sector. It's not the United States or the rest of the world. It's the United States and the rest of the world. And we're thinking about this as if we can just go it alone. The private sector, laissez-faire, the market will heal itself. Government, I don't need you involved in me. Government, I know best, I'm going to regulate every sector there is. It's not either or, it's an and. And we're not talking about it as an and in the United States. And we're actually driving the conversation in Europe and elsewhere to be an or, not an and. And we're thinking that we, the United States, being arrogant, that we could do it without some of our key allies. And then finally, we need to start holding our leaders and the companies responsible for delivering poor product. We need to hold our leaders and the companies accountable for bringing transparency to the problem. And we need to bring our leaders and the government accountable for telling us the truth about what's going on and starting to talk to us about what needs to be done going forward. We can't sweep this under the rug anymore. We need to be talking about the elephant in the room. That brings us to three. I'm told, and I have many mentors, that we all digest data differently, right? Some of us are visual people. Some of us have to read it. Some of us have to hear it and everything. But we also digest data in very different ways along the lines of stories. So I'm going to tell you three sticky stories. And I, I hope that I speak one of the languages. So the first is I'm going to appeal to the mind, logical. This is me. I'm the logic. It doesn't always hold water, though. So first, the logic. I talked about some of the intellectual property theft. There was a commission that was just uh, uh, finished its work in the United States. And it was led by Admiral Denny Blair and many of our corporate leaders, um, so a mix of government and corporate leaders. And they published a study that said that the United States is losing at least $300 billion a year in intellectual property theft. $300 billion a year. That's current to the annual exports to Asia, and it's 1% of our GDP. 1% of our GDP. All right, we're only growing at 2%, maybe one and a half. We're losing 1%, just IP theft, not e-crime and not all of the other things that are going on. It's millions of jobs. 
That's a challenge. If that doesn't appeal to you, I'm also a mom. And I have a 12 and 13 year old boy and the boys and they're going to be going into high school and they're going to go to college. And do you know that <clears throat> our children's social security numbers are being stolen at unprecedented rates? Almost 10%. And they're being used to buy homes, to get driver's license, open lines of credit. And many of our kids, we won't know until they're going to apply to college that they're in debt. Some of them are in debt as much as $750,000 as the day that they go and they start to apply to college. Is that acceptable? That we're allowing organized crime and criminals to actually steal the future of our children? What are we gonna do about it? And the victims under age of five is jumping year over year because we don't know that their social securities are being stolen. We don't have the identity check. We figure that we don't need to worry about credit cards for my five-year-old. We don't have to worry about that until they're high school or until they're going to college. And so you won't know, and then you're gonna stumble into a really thick problem. And I have friends of mine that actually have had this actually happen to them. And it's affecting their ability for their whole future, acquire a mobile phone, a job, and a secure place to live and going to college. And I find that just un unacceptable. All right, if it doesn't appeal to your heart and you're not a logic person, most everybody can sympathize or empathize with money. And I'm gonna appeal to the wallet, right? And so I talked a little bit about the Saudi Aramco, but that was a boardroom wake up call. The oil and gas industry around the world, it was not just Stuxnet, but this, the Shamoon virus, and destroying the, in fact, through a USB thumb drive, coming into the back office with a, with a malicious code on it or a military grade weapon comes in 75% of the IT infrastructure. It's funny, if you start to talk to many of the corporate leaders and you go to the boardroom, cybersecurity is now starting to come up on the risk register. What are we doing to secure our corporate assets? How much money are we spending? What's at risk? Do we really know what the most important assets and systems are? Do we really know what is the most important information and where it's stored? There's been another number, a couple of other thefts that have happened and I'll just talk to maybe one or two and then I'll tell one more sticky story even though it was going to be three. So we've had attacks against some of our key companies, one would be up here in this, uh, in, in this part of the world is RSA. How many people use the RSA key? VPN into your company? So they had a, an attack and uh, compromised the key infrastructure and the ability to, uh, to really secure through two-factor authentication. So I wanna actually email or be at my house and get to my company. Usually you have a, your name, password, and then if you really want to be more secure, you have a second factor of authentication, which is this random digit that re, you know, redoes itself every 60 seconds. Some, you must know this, right? Okay, well, when you lose the, the ability to authenticate that key every 60 seconds or somebody has it, and since we have all of our identities have likely been stolen, you got the identity, and you got this thing, and you got the keys to the kingdom. Well, the keys to the kingdom were lost, and there were a lot of companies that were penetrated as a result of it. And then you start to think about, wow, I had an authenticated information that's now being lost. I'm not going to necessarily see it leave my company because in theory it's coming through a trusted person with now tainted technology. And that's happening a lot. Okay, so the average company <clears throat> doesn't know that they've been penetrated. It takes them almost 173 days to find out that they've been penetrated. Can you imagine? I have the keys in the kingdom, I can come in and out, I can come in and out, I can steal money, I can steal intellectual property, I can do whatever I want. Ingress, egress, 173 days without noticing. A lot can happen to a company in 173 days. Some of them actually go under in 173 days. The average cost per breach of a data record to a company right now is somewhere around $250. Uh, the average cost for starting just one infection, you'd clicked on the wrong link and you got, poof, you got a virus. It costs about $250,000 per each one of those. The average company sees a minimum of 10 of the week. 
The Department of Defense has at least 6,000 a day. It starts to add up. And then you start to see that most companies will spend at least a million dollars on the cleanup. Just think, if you have an average of even five a week, and then you gotta clean up five a week, it starts to add up. On the digital balance sheet and your digital liabilities, it's a real problem. So one more sticky story, so I'm, I'm avoiding my own path. And this is a personal story, but it's about the cloud. How many people are using cloud? You've got Gmail, you're doing something, Facebook, you've got all this data stored in the cloud. I'm just gonna, and some of you have heard me speak, I'm gonna tell another personal story, and it's a little bit old, but I, it sticks. It's my sticky story. So um, uh, the year of like Snowmageddon on the East Coast, what was that, 2010, 20, 2009, 2010, right? Where we had blizzard after blizzard after blizzard. Well, I found myself in an unfortunate place. I was trying to get home um, uh, the week of, uh, right before the holidays, and I was stuck uh, because we had two feet of snow on the ground and, and the planes weren't flying. And um, I get home and I found for the very first time ever, that I'm in a mall on Christmas Eve because I didn't have time to do my Christmas shopping and stuff. So I've never been to the mall on Christmas Eve, so I have no idea what to expect, right? And um, we have to, we're in the Lego store and we're buying Legos for, my, I have one son with me, my older son, Alexander, um, and he's nine at the time. Uh, so it's 2009. And, uh, and we're online, we're getting stuff for his cousins and his younger brother. And, uh, and there's a, a really long queue. There's more than 20 people in the queue. And the manager comes up to me and he says, well, ma'am, it's gonna be a while. And I was like, cause I'm just gonna go pay. And I look at him and I was like, okay, I can see that. There's a lot of people in front of me. And he says, no, no, ma'am, it's really gonna be a while. And I said, well, why is that? Well, the server's down. Because they're doing in the cloud provisioning of the infrastructure for inventory and the kiosk, et cetera, right? And I said, well, okay, how long has it been down for? It's been down for more than an hour. And I looked at Alexander and I said, Alexander, go put the Legos away, we're gonna go. And he's like, well, why, mommy? Don't you have cash? And I said, yes, I have cash. I might even have cash to the penny to pay for the tax. And he says, well, you know, what's wrong with that? Why can't we do that? And I said, well, because the computer's not working, because it's not being provisioned, right? They can't take inventory. They don't know what Legos they're getting ready to sell. They probably need the computer to do the math for the taxes, among other things. And he turns to me and he says, mommy, we're not a very advanced society if we can't go backwards. <laughs> and start to think about how much of your information as a company and as a person might be up in the cloud and what happens when the cloud goes down and you can't access it and what is that service level agreement that says that it's going to be up 24 by 7 that they've got a backup of your data do they what happens if they have um, a software glitch and they inadvertently lose all of your data. When was the last time that you backed up your data from the cloud? I have lots of stories, sticky stories of my personal woes of the cloud. <coughs> I'm gonna get down to two, just two. Are you gonna be a master of your own destiny or are we going to continue to admire the problem? And I see this really kind of breaking down of you can lead and you can have your voice heard, or we can continue to talk about it and admire it and sweep it under the rug. And what are we gonna do about it? I'm tired of the victims. I'm tired of us all saying, oh my gosh, I can't do anything about it because we can do a lot about it. That comes down to one. It doesn't have to be this way. When we look forward one year, three years, five years, are we gonna look back and say, oh, if I had only done this, if I had only said something, if I had only done something, it doesn't have to be that way. It has to start with each and every one of us. We can't just say, it's my elected official, it's my CEO. Each and every one of us has a responsibility. And so I wanna spend the last just few moments talking about what I think needs to be done. 
there are at least five mechanisms for change. You can fix the policies. You can address the law. You can address the technology. You can try to throw as much money at it or as little money at it as possible. There's money. And then there's some externalities that are outside of our control, internationally and sometimes technology-wise. So right now, the true heart of it, we're in 2013, November 2013, and what are we facing? We have political paralysis in Washington. I live there. I'm glad that I'm not there right now. We have a continuing resolution that will last for likely all of FY14. We have a sequester that's being pushed quarter by quarter that's going to, that continues to slow our government reaction, if not paralyze our government reaction. So right now, it's like dismal times in, in the policy and in the political apparatus. So 2013 or FY14 doesn't look very good. If you're in the defense business, good luck and start to look at how you diversify. 2014, we have in November 2014, there's a really important international negotiation that's going to talk about the future of the internet. It's going to talk about regulation of the internet. It's going to talk about monetization of the internet. It's going to talk about who controls the internet. And there are countries and forces that are out there, especially as a result of the PRISM program and things that have been disclosed about the United States that have disadvantaged the United States, if not um, truly degraded any position that the United States might take in that international negotiation. And the truth is, is the factors that are playing out right now for that negotiation in November of 2014 is going to potentially shift control of the internet from the west to the east, from the developed to the developing countries. And we may not have as much of a say in the matter, but it requires true leadership and lots of forward thinking and partnership and alliance between government and industry, between the United States and many allies, and maybe not so much the traditional allies. Okay, so then in November 2015, let's just say, <coughs> is the Internet of Things comes on. So if we haven't started to address the true security measures that need to be based in our core infrastructure, our vulnerabilities are gonna double between now and 2015. That's not too long from now. They'll double again in 20, by 2020. And so we have a true technology shift happening. At the same time, in 2015, you're going to have a new slate of candidates that are going to want to be the next president of the United States. And the last thing that happens in 2015 is the FY17 budget that gets built for the US government. And it's the budget that the next president will inherit. What are we going to leave the next president as a legacy when we look back? three and a half, four years from now. What is that president going to get? What are we going to do about it? And then, of course, nothing will happen in Washington, politically, or other things, in 2016, as we're going through the presidential race. So if I were queen for the day, or if I were to ask you all of what I would want you to advocate for, because I have to give you a homework assignment, there are five things that I think we should do. They're controversial, of course. They require real decisions, of course. There's an elephant in the room, and I'm going to talk to you about five parts of the elephant that I think need to be done. First of all, we are not serious about cybersecurity in the United States, because if we were, our policy would have market adoption along with it. We're serious about energy diversification. We pay our citizens to drive electric cars. We pay our citizens, you get a tax credit, for putting new windows on these Victorian houses. You get tax write-offs for those things, for energy efficient windows, for the next fuel system, for replacing your air conditioner with something that's going to draw less energy <clears throat> as a citizen. As a business, you also get tax credits if you put solar panels or you use wind generation, or you use some next generation coal. If you use a different, other than electric power, you'll get paid for it. Or oil and gas, you'll get paid for it. 
And then more importantly as a business, because we want the businesses to innovate our way through this, we will give them a 17% R&D tax credit in order to create the next generation technology for the policy that we want. We are doing no such thing for cybersecurity. We are only talking about regulating our industry. We're not talking about how do we incentivize market adoption. If we're gonna get serious about it, we need to talk about the full mix of market levers. Second, we do have regulation. And as I mentioned, the United States is the number one infected infrastructure. So you know who has the responsibility to clean that up? Our internet service providers. They're already a regulated industry. I think they should be further regulated because they should tell you when you're infected and they should actually make sure that you don't get on the internet if you're infected because you could be conducting the distributed denial of service against the bank and you just don't know it. They could also be responsible for ensuring that the next weapons grade uh, military capability doesn't come to pick the company in the United States. They are the control plane. They could do a lot more and we should hold them accountable for doing more and you as citizens and businesses should ask them to do more. Third, how is it possible that we could allow technology to be embedded in every part of our way of life that is not properly engineered and is full of flaws and vulnerabilities? Just because we want it bad doesn't mean we should get it bad. Why can't we, as we're approaching 2015, and we want that next really cool widget, or 2020 for the Internet of Everything, why can't we demand that they invest in the technology and drive a technology that is well engineered with as minimum flaws as possible so that you cannot be harnessed and take over and have a description and service? And FY17 is not too far around the corner. Money-wise, we can't lose sight of that budget. Regardless of what's going on with the continuing resolution and the sequester and whatever political paralysis we have in Washington, the FY17 budget is critical to the next president and it's responsible upon the current leadership to make sure that they don't blow it for the next leadership. And then finally, there are a lot of internal, external factors that are happening internationally. There are two very significant international negotiations coming up, one in 2014 and one in 2015. We need to start focusing on the United States companies and their economic competitiveness and our overall long range future of competitiveness in our economy. Because it's being degraded every single day by countries who want to bring it harm, who want to actually make money on the backs of our people and our companies, who don't want to invest, they want to steal. So what are we gonna do about it? These international relations and these external factors are really essential. And quite frankly, right now, we don't have enough attention on what's being done to us around the, around the world and especially in the United States. So the only thing necessary is for us to do nothing. If we do nothing, then we're gonna continue to be victims. And I don't wanna be a victim anymore. I wanna see Team America stand up. I want everybody in this room to do something about it. Just talk about what's going on. Tell a sticky story. And let's change what the, port, the path and course that we're on for the next three, four, five, ten years. Thank you. <laughs>